here. We look forward to sharing in this worship service today on the first Sunday of Lent together. I invite you to register your attendance on the white cards that are included in your order of service, and we will collect those during the offering time. Diane, would you please uh, offer us an invitation to a big night out? <laughs> This Friday night is our family uh, game night. And when we say family, it's any age. We are all a family together. But we will have some fun games, some minute to win it games, and then some board games. So it's something for everybody. We'll start at 6, and then we'll end with some ice cream. So, Wonderful. You'll notice in your order of service today, you have an encore uh, uh, brochure, which is also an offering envelope. Today is our annual uh, Umcor offering. This is an important year for Umcor. It is its 80th anniversary year, and Umcor was um, started 80 years ago. World War II uh, was raging, and millions of people were uh, displaced from their homes. And so the uh, Methodist Church at that time responded by creating the Methodist Committee on Overseas Relief and started an annual offering called One Great Hour Sharing, which is the way a lot of us remember uh, this offering. In 2016, the name was then changed to the Umcor Sunday offering um, in order to honor and recognize the work that Umcor does around the world uh, all year long. So in honor of the 80th year, uh, Umcor sent out a video that I want to show you that will explain very much uh, what we already know, and that is the wonderful work that Umcor does and the importance of this annual offering. So let's see that video now, please. There's an old definition of a disaster, and that's to be without a star. And the thing that happens many times after disasters is that the power goes out in some places, and people can actually see the stars. But they can also see the stars in one another. The peace that would pass his understanding, and the leadership that would guide people through their time of need. Amco, the United Methodist Committee on Relief, says that it is our stand the development uh, arm of the whole United Methodist Church. When you give to Amcor, you give 100% to the project you are supporting and to the disaster you want to respond to. This is only possible because on Amcor Sunday, the United Methodist people raise funds so that the administrative cost of Amcor are already covered. Well, Amcor, of course, responds to emergencies with funding, training, and expertise, but we're mostly known for being in it for the long haul. Uh, we work alongside the conferences as they set up projects and programs to try to see families and individuals through to their recovery, which sometimes takes months and most often years. We're very busy, we're a very small team, but we work hard. And Uncor exists because of the donation of its members, the UFC people. So if there is a million people giving a one dollar each, it makes more than one person giving 10,000. Amcor has been for more than 75 years in this business of being whole, of being there for people in need in the moment of disaster when they have lost everything. And through Amcor, the United Methodist people are whole in these situations. You know, walls are coming down, um, people are, are coming together, and they don't have power yet, but they're still finding ways to feed each other. And that feeds the soul, not just the body. Lift up those who have fallen. What a privilege it is to be part of this important ministry, the United Methodist Church, to be able to say we're there, we bring hope, and we bring healing. As people are helping their neighbor and helping each other in their community, they begin to see that the love of God has not left them. It's right there. So Uncle wants to support that wonderful thing that can happen after disasters. Uncle wants to be there with the people who are noticing the stars of one another. And they're noticing God's grace all around.
notice the stars in one another. Uh, so I encourage your generosity this year, as, uh, as you do every year, knowing that uh, this offering pays for the administrative costs, for, of course, so that when there is a, a disaster, 100% of our gifts at that time go directly to the people in need. So thank you so much for that ahead of time. Let's stand and greet one another. God, 
is most gracious in blessing us and lifting us beyond our losses and our fears. In Christ we are linked with God's saving grace for all time and eternity. In the name of Christ, you are loved and forgiven. In the name of Christ, you are loved and forgiven. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Now a special treat.
chapter 5, verses 12 through 19. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death came through sin, and so death spread to all, because all have sinned, sin was indeed in the world before the law, but sin is not reckoned when there is no law. Yet death exercised dominion from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgressions of Adam, who is the type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died through one man's trespass, much more surely have the grace of God and the free gift in the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for the many. And the free gift is not like the effect of the one man's sin. For the judgment following one, one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brings justification. If because of the one man's trespass, death exercised dominion through that one, much more surely will, will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness exercise dominion in the life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. For just as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous.
Let's pray together. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We begin our Lenten journey with an ancient story about why we need to go on this journey in the first place. So let's begin at the beginning, in Genesis. We're going to skip over the first creation story where God created the world in six days and then took a well-deserved rest. That beautiful story is a hymn of praise for God's creative power and design. The text for today begins after that, and it's called by some the second creation story. It was written by another author, and it tells a story about how and why people were created as part of God's purposeful design. Now, <clears throat> there is not a text in Genesis, and I would venture perhaps for the rest of the whole Bible, that is more used and abused, interpreted and misunderstood than the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Most of the interpretations that we associate with this Old Testament story are Christian interpretations. As Christian people, we embrace both the Old and the New Testaments as a revelation of God's presence and power in the world. In the Hebrew scriptures, through the books of the law and the teachings of the prophets, we believe that God revealed God's self to the Jewish people. In the New Testament stories, we believe that God took on flesh and then revealed himself in the person of Jesus to the whole world. Both revelations are our stories. We are people of the whole book. And as Christians, then, we inherit both legacies. But our Bible studies will be more faithful and enhanced if we keep in mind that the Old Testament was written and told to Hebrew people, and the New Testament was written and taught to Christians. And though we are very closely related and we share kin, there are some theological differences. For Christians, there is an inclination to read the Old Testament through Christian eyes, or I might say with a, a Christian perspective. And as we look at a number of Old Testament texts during this Lenten season, I would like to encourage us as much as possible to be open to understanding these stories in their Jewish context. Of all the stories that we're going to look at this season, today, today's deserves to stand on its own. It doesn't need to really be summarized or explained all that much. It's just so beautiful and so rich a story. But what I do want to do is to just talk about a few assumptions that we might try to set aside as we hear this story today so that the text might better speak for itself. The first thing to recognize is that we're not dealing with history here. This is literature. It's a story. We're not studying facts. We're reading about fictional characters in an imaginary place. But what happens to them there, though, their struggle with temptation is a human struggle. Adam and Eve, whose names literally mean humanity and life, are every man and every woman. And their story speaks not just of their experience of being faithful, but of all of our experiences. This is a story about living a faithful life on God's terms. The second thing to remember is that as an Old Testament text, the ancient writers were not concerned about the origins of sin or evil or fear in the same way that Christians were. The Jews believed that faithfulness came to them by following the law the Torah. And what they wanted to know from these stories was about how to deal with feelings like temptation and selfishness. The third thing to recognize is the different interpretations that Christianity has placed on this story. Through Christian history, the Garden of Eden story has been given a lot more weight and significance than Old Testament scholars believe it was ever meant to have. The Christian interpretations are layered on so thick that the original message is often lost. In Christian tradition, the Christian story, the creation story, is frequently looked to as an end-all explanation for a very long list of religious problems. It's seen as the explanation for original sin. It's given as the reason why evil came into this world. It's seen as a source of the tension that exists between men and women. 
and it's relied upon as the explanation for why there is death. Well, what I would like us to do today is to suspend any previously held ideas about the Garden of Eden for the time being, and hear this story as an ancient Hebrew man or woman would hear it. And the one question they might ask of this story is simply, what is required to be faithful? Now, this is the first Sunday of Lent, and the next 40 days or so are a time for us to ponder that same question. What is required of us to be faithful? So here's a story about two people who learned what it meant to be faithful on God's terms. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground, but a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden in, Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flows out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divides and becomes four branches. The name of the first is Pishon, which is the one that flows around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Delium and the onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gion. It's the one that flows around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will die. Then the Lord God said, It's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was his name. The man gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. And for the man there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then the Lord God took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now the serpent was the animals that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you will die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. 
And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten up from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? The woman said, the serpent tricked me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbirth. In pain you shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to the man he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorn and thistle it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man named his wife Eve, because she was the mother of all who live. And the Lord God made garments of skin for the man and for his wife, and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, See, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat, and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a sword flaming and turning to guard the way to the tree of life. On our Lent journeys, this story reminds us that the opposite of knowledge is not ignorance, but trust. Trusting in God means that we cannot know all things. And that promises that we make only have value when they're kept. So this Lenten season, let's stand before the mysteries of God with awe and great respect. For God has given us a life that when lived faithfully will be like paradise. Amen. Together, let us stand and affirm our faith. We believe in God our Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on we believe in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. We sing together now as we enter a time of prayer.
creation. We come once more to be in this place and give thanks for your love that calls us. And we're reminded that your love and mercy last forever and are as fresh as this morning's sunrise. So we rejoice that this day dawns as a reminder that we are alive in you, and it is in you that we live, move, and have our being. Lift us beyond our fears and move us to be your people. We live as reminded people that while we moved out of your presence in the garden, we never lost your love. We are ever mindful of our desire to return to the garden and to your loving acceptance. We're reminded that this planet is our garden and that we must care for it. May we be good stewards of our environment. We are reminded in the Lenten season that we need to dedicate a portion of each day to being mindful of our call to be love and to seek to return to your love by sharing with those in need around us. We are reminded this day of those in need of compassion and sympathy. And we extend our heartfelt love to Mary Dell Worthington and her family as they grieve the loss of her daughter, Katrina. Bring them comfort in their loss. And we pray for Jeff McConnell and Carol Harrison, who will have procedures coming this week. And for Deidre Sanford, who had to return to the hospital last week. We lift Christopher Colby and Matthew Steinbacher as their prayer quilts carry our prayers for their comfort and healing. We pray for those seeking a cure for the coronavirus. Guide them in their research and may those affected be healed. And gracious God, calm our fears and give us clarity and calmness to cope with the challenges of disease. We are aware of those among us struggling with issues of life and ask now for you to hear both our joys and concerns as we lift them aloud. Congregation, I invite you to lift aloud those joys and concerns. Gracious God, as we come to the table this morning, may we each find what we need, and may we go away sharing what we have, and may this Lent be a time of searching ourselves, not in judgment, but in honest reflection that we might be all you call us to be. Remind us always that it is in your image that we are formed, and, fo and that following Christ means living out a life of compassion. We pray always in the name of the risen Christ, whose life is our example of being fully alive. Amen. I invite the ushers to come and receive our tithes and offerings, please. <coughs>
observe an open communion, which means there is a place set at this table uh, for everyone. You need not be a member of this church or any church to uh, participate in communion. In this congregation, we receive communion by intention, which means you come forward as uh, at the usher's direction, take a piece of bread and dip it into the cup and then return to your seat. If you would be more comfortable staying in your seat, just let an usher know and we'd be most pleased to bring the elements to you. The ritual is on page 17 in your order of service, in the hymnal. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You brought all things into being and called them good. From the dust of the earth you formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. When rain fell upon the earth forty days and forty nights, you bore up the ark on the waters and saved Noah and his family and established an everlasting covenant with every living creature upon the earth. When you delivered us from slavery and made us your covenant people, you led Moses to your mountain for 40 days and 40 nights and gave us your teaching. You led us through the wilderness and fed us manna for 40 years and brought us into the promised land. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. as we 
as we are our one body, for it is from one loaf which we all partake. When we eat this bread, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? And likewise, when we give thanks over the cup, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The gifts of God for the people of God are many.
sing the first verse, and we'll sing uh, the second and third verses with them. 